The Troll, written by T. H. White, read by Edward E. French. My father, said Mr. Marks, used to say that an experience like the one I'm about to relate was apt to shake one's interest in mundane matters. Naturally, he did not expect to be believed, and he did not mind whether he was or not. He did not himself believe in the supernatural, but the thing happened, and he proposed to tell it as simply as possible. It was stupid of him to say that it shook his faith in mundane matters, for it was just as mundane as anything else. Indeed, the really frightening part about it was the horribly tangible atmosphere in which it took place. None of the outlines wavered in the least. The creature would have been less remarkable if it had been less natural. It seemed to overcome the usual laws without being immune to them. My father was a keen fisherman and used to go to all sorts of places for his fish. On one occasion he made a bisco in Lapland his base, a comfortable railway hotel, one hundred and fifty miles within the Arctic Circle. He travelled the prodigious length of Sweden. I believe it is as far from the south of Sweden to the north as it is from the south of Sweden to the south of Italy in the electric railway, and arrived tired out. He went to bed early sleeping almost immediately, although it was bright daylight outside, as it is in those parts throughout the night at that time of the year. Not the least shaking part of his experience was that it should all have happened under the sun. He went to bed early and slept and dreamed. I may as well make it clear at once, as clear as the outlines of that creature in the northern sun, that his story did not turn out to be a dream in the last paragraph. The division between sleeping and waking was abrupt, although the feeling of both was the same. They were both in the same sphere of horrible absurdity, though in the former he was asleep, and in the latter almost terribly awake. He tried to be asleep several times. My father always used to tell one of his dreams, because it somehow seemed of a piece with what was to follow. He believed that it was a consequence of the thing's presence in the next room. My father dreamed of blood. It was the vividness of the dreams that was impressive, their minute detail and horrible reality. The blood came through the keyhole of a locked door which communicated with the next room. I suppose the two rooms had originally been designed en suite. It ran down the door panel with a viscous ripple, like the artificial one created in the conduit of Trumpington Street. But it was heavy and smelled. The slow welling of it sopped the carpet and reached the bed. It was warm and sticky. My father woke up with the impression that it was all over his hands. He was rubbing his first two fingers together, trying to rid them of the greasy adhesion where the fingers joined. My father knew what he had got to do. Let me make it clear that he was now perfectly wide awake, but he knew what he had got to do. He got out of bed, under this irresistible knowledge, and looked through the keyhole into the next room. I suppose the best way to tell the story is simply to narrate it without an effort to carry belief. The thing did not require belief. It was not a feeling of horror in one's bones or a misty outline or anything that needed to be given actuality by an act of faith. It was as solid as a wardrobe. You don't have to believe in wardrobes. They are there, with corners. What my father saw through the keyhole in the next room was a troll. It was eminently solid about eight feet high, and dressed in brightly ornamented skins. It had a blue face with yellow eyes, and on its head there was a woolly sort of nightcap with a red bobble on top. The features were Mongolian. Its body was long and sturdy, like the trunk of a tree. Its legs were short and thick, like the elephant's feet that used to be cut off for umbrella stands, and its arms were wasted, little rudimentary members like the forelegs of a kangaroo. Its head and neck were very thick and massive. On the whole it looked like a grotesque doll. That was the horror of it. Imagine a perfectly normal gollywog, but without the association of a Christie minstrel, standing in the corner of a room eight feet high. The creature was as ordinary as that, as tangible, as stuffed, and as ungainly at the joints, but it could move itself about. The troll was eating a lady. Poor girl, she was tightly clenched to its breast by those rudimentary arms, with her head on a level with its mouth. She was dressed in a nightdress which had crumpled up under her armpits so that she was a pitiful naked offering, like a classical picture of Andromeda. Mercifully, she appeared to have fainted. J. 
just as my father applied his eye to the keyhole. The troll opened its mouth and bit off her head. Then, holding the neck between the bright blue lips, he sucked the bare meat dry. She shriveled like a squeezed orange, and her heels clicked. The creature had a look of thoughtful ecstasy. When the girl seemed to have lost succulence as an orange, she was lifted into the air. She vanished in two bites. The troll remained leaning against the wall, munching patiently and casting its eyes about it with a vague benevolence. Then it leaned forward from the low hips, like a jackknife folding in half, and opened its mouth to lick the blood up from the carpet. The mouth was incandescent inside, like a gas fire, and the blood evaporated before its tongue, like dust before a vacuum cleaner. It straightened itself, the arms dangling before it in patient uselessness, and fixed its eyes upon the keyhole. My father crawled back to bed, like a hunted fox after fifteen miles. At first it was because he was afraid that the creature had seen him through the hole, but afterward it was because of his reason. A man can attribute many nighttime appearances to the imagination, and can ultimately persuade himself that creatures of the dark did not exist. But this was an appearance in a sunlit room, with all the solidity of a wardrobe and, unfortunately, almost none of its possibility. He spent the first ten minutes making sure that he was awake, and the rest of the night trying to hope that he was asleep. It was either that, or else he was mad. It is not pleasant to doubt one's sanity. There are no satisfactory tests one can pinch oneself to see if one is asleep, but there are no means of determining the other problem. He spent some time opening and shutting his eyes, but the room seemed normal and remained unaltered. He also soused his head in a basin of cold water, without result. Then he lay on his back for hours, watching the mosquitoes on the ceiling. He was tired when he was called. A bright Scandinavian maid admitted the full sunlight for him and told him that it was a fine day. He spoke to her several times and watched her carefully, but she seemed to have no doubts about his behavior. Evidently, then, he was not badly mad, and by now he had been thinking about the matter for so many hours that it had begun to get obscure. The outlines were blurring again, and he determined that the whole thing must have been a dream or a temporary delusion, something temporary, anyway, and finished with it, so that there was no good in thinking about it longer. He got up, dressed himself fairly cheerfully, and went down to breakfast. These hotels used to be run extraordinarily well. There was a hostess, always handy, in a little office off the hall, who was delighted to answer any questions, spoke every conceivable language, and generally made it her business to make the guests feel at home. The particular hostess at Abisko was a lovely creature into the bargain. My father used to speak to her a good deal. He had an idea that when you had a bath in Sweden, one of the maids was sent to wash you. As a matter of fact, this sometimes used to be the case, but it was always an old maid and highly trusted. You had to keep yourself underwater, and this was supposed to confer a cloak of invisibility. If you popped your knee out, she was shocked. My father had a dim sort of hope that the hostess would be sent to bathe him one day, and I dare say he would have shocked her a good deal. However, this is beside the point. As he passed through the hall, something prompted him to ask about the room next to his. Had anybody, he inquired, taken number twenty-three? But yes, said the lady manager, with a bright smile. Twenty-three is taken by a doctor professor from Uppsala and his wife, such a charming couple. My father wondered what the charming couple had been doing whilst the troll was eating the lady in the nightdress. However, he decided to think no more about it. He pulled himself together and went in to breakfast. The professor was sitting in an opposite corner. The manageress had kindly pointed him out, looking mild and short-sighted by himself. My father thought he would go out for a long climb on the mountains, since exercise was evidently what his constitution needed. He had a lovely day. Lake Torna blazed a deep blue below him for all its thirty miles, and the melting snow made a lacework of filigree around the tops of the surrounding mountain basin. He got away from the stunted birch trees and the mossy bogs with the reindeer in them, and the mosquitoes, too. He forded something that might have been a temporary tributary of the Abisko yoke, having to take off his trousers to do so, and tucking his shirt up around his neck. He wanted to shout, 
bracing himself against the glorious tug of the snow water, with his legs crossing each other involuntarily as they passed, and the boulders turning under his feet. His body made a bow wave in the water, which climbed and feathered on his stomach on the upstream side. When he was under the opposite bank, a stone turned in earnest, and he went in. He came up shouting with laughter, and made out loud a remark which has since become a classic in my family. "'Thank God,' he said. "'I rolled up my sleeves.' He wrung out everything as best he could, and dressed again in the wet clothes, and set off up the shoulder of Niaket Yelvik. He was dry and warm again in half a mile. Less than a thousand feet took him over the snow line, and there, crawling on hands and knees, he came face to face with what seemed to be the summit of ambition. He met an ermine. They were both on all fours, so that there was a sort of equality about the encounter, especially as the ermine was higher up than he was. They looked at each other for a fifth of a second without saying anything, and then the ermine vanished. He searched for it everywhere in vain, for the snow was only patchy. My father sat down on a dry rock to eat his well-soaked luncheon of chocolate and rye bread. Life is such an unutterable hell, solely because it is sometimes beautiful. If we could only be miserable all the time, if there could be no such things as love or beauty or faith or hope, if I could be absolutely certain that my love would never be returned, how much more simple life would be. One could plod through the Siberian salt mines of existence without being bothered about happiness. Unfortunately, the happiness is there. There is always the chance, about eight hundred and fifty to one, that another heart will come to mine. I can't help hoping and keeping faith and loving beauty. Quite frequently I am not so miserable as it would be wise to be. And there, for my poor father sitting on his boulder above the snow, was stark happiness beating at the gates. The boulder on which he was sitting had probably never been sat upon before. It was a hundred and fifty miles within the Arctic Circle, on a mountain five thousand feet high, looking down on a blue lake. The lake was so long that he could have sworn it sloped away at the ends, proving to the naked eye that the sweet earth was round. The railway line and the half-dozen houses of Bisco were hidden in the trees. The sun was warm on the boulder, blue on the snow, and his body tingled smooth from the spate water. His mouth watered for the chocolate just behind the tip of his tongue. And yet, when he had eaten the chocolate, perhaps it was heavy on his stomach, there was the memory of the troll. My father fell suddenly into a black mood and began to think about the supernatural. Lapland was beautiful in the summer, with the sun sweeping around the horizon day and night, and the small tree leaves twinkling. It was not the sort of place for wicked things. But what about the winter? A picture of the Arctic night came before him, with the silence and the snow. Then the legendary wolves and bears snuffled at the far encampments, and the nameless winter spirits moved on their darkling courses. Lapland had always been associated with sorcery, even by Shakespeare. It was at the outskirts of the world that the old things accumulated, like driftwood around the edges of the sea. If one wanted to find a wise woman, one went to the rims of the Hebrides. On the coast of Brittany one sought the mass of saint sacaire And what an outskirt Lapland was! It was an outskirt not only of Europe, but of civilization. It had no boundaries. The Laps went with the reindeer, and where the reindeer were was Lapland, curiously indefinite region, suitable to the indefinite things. The Laps were not Christians. What a fund of power they must have had behind them to resist the march of mind. All through the missionary centuries they had held to something, something that stood behind them, a power against Christ. My father realized with a shock that he was living in the age of the reindeer a period contiguous to the mammoth and the fossil. Well, this was not what he had come out to do. He dismissed the nightmares with an effort, got up from his boulder, and began to scramble back to his hotel. It was impossible that a professor from Abisko could become a troll. As my father was going in to dinner that evening, the manageress stopped him in the hall. We have had a day so sad, she said. The poor doctor professor has disappeared his wife. She has been missing since last night. The professor is inconsolable. 
My father then knew for certain that he had lost his reason. He went blindly to dinner, without making any answer, and began to eat a thick sour cream soup that had taken cold with pepper and sugar. The professor was still sitting in his corner, a sandy-headed man with thick spectacles and a desolate expression. He was looking at my father, and my father, with a soup-spoon halfway to his mouth, looked at him. You know the eye-to-eye -eye recognition, when two people look deeply into each other's pupils and burrow to the soul. It usually comes before love. I mean, the clear, deep, milk-eyed recognition expressed by the poet Dunn. Their eye-beams twisted and did thread their eyes upon a double string. My father recognized that the professor was a troll, and the professor recognized my father's recognition. Both of them knew that the professor had eaten his wife. My father put down his soup-spoon and the professor began to grow. The top of his head lifted and expanded, like a great loaf rising in an oven. His face went red and purple, and finally blue. The whole ungainly upperworks began to sway and topple toward the ceiling. My father looked about him. The other diners were eating unconcernedly. Nobody else could see it, and he was definitely mad at last. When he looked at the troll again, the creature bowed. The enormous superstructure inclined itself toward him from the hips and grinned seductively. My father got up from his table experimentally and advanced toward the troll, arranging his feet on the carpet with excessive care. He did not find it easy to walk or to approach the monster, but it was a question of his reason. If he was mad, he was mad, and it was essential that he should come to grips with the thing in order to make certain. He stood before it like a small boy, and held out his hand, saying, "'Good evening.' "'Ha, <laughs> ha!' said the troll. "'Little mannequin! <laughs> and what shall I have for my supper to-night?' Then it held out its wizened furry paw, and took my father by the hand. My father went straight out of the dining-room, walking on air. He found the manageress in the passage, and held out his hand to her. I am afraid I've burned my hand, he said. Did you think you could tie it up? The manageress said, But it is a very bad burn. There are blisters all over the back. Of course I will bind it up at once. He explained that he had burned it on one of the spirit lamps at the sideboard. He could scarcely conceal his delight. One cannot burn oneself by being insane. I saw you talking to the doctor professor, said the manageress, as she was putting on the bandage. He is a sympathetic gentleman, is he not? The relief about his sanity soon gave place to other troubles. The troll had eaten its wife and given him a blister, but it had also made an unpleasant remark about its supper that evening. It proposed to eat my father. Now very few people can have been in a position to decide what to do when a troll earmarks them for its next meal. To begin with, although it was a tangible troll in two ways, it had been invisible to the other diners. This put my father in a difficult position. He could not, for instance, ask for protection. He could scarcely go to the manageress and say, Professor School is an odd kind of werewolf, ate his wife last night, and proposes to eat me this evening. He would have found himself in a loony bin at once. Besides, he was too proud to do this, and still too confused. Whatever the proofs and blisters, he did not find it easy to believe in professors that turned into trolls. He had lived in the normal world all his life, and, at his age, it was difficult to start learning afresh. It would have been quite easy for a baby who was still coordinating the world to cope with the troll situation. For my father, not. He kept trying to fit it in somewhere without disturbing the universe. He kept telling himself that it was nonsense. One did not get eaten by professors. It was like having a fever and telling oneself it was all right, really only a delirium, only something that would pass. There was that feeling on one side, the desperate assertion of all the truths that he had learned so far, the tussle to keep the world from drifting, the brave but intimidated refusal to give in or to make a fool of himself. On the other side there was stark terror, however much one struggled to be merely deluded or hitched up momentarily in an odd pocket of space-time. There was panic. There was the urge to go away as quickly as possible, to flee the dreadful troll. Unfortunately, the last train had left Bisco, and there was nowhere else to go. 
My father was not able to distinguish these trends of thought. For him they were at the time intricately muddled together. He was in a whirl, a proud man and an agnostic. He stuck to his muddled guns alone. He was terribly afraid of the troll. But he could not afford to admit its existence. All his mental processes remained hung up whilst he talked on the terrace, in a state of suspended animation, with an American tourist who had come to Abisko to photograph the midnight sun. The American told my father that the Abisko Railway was the northernmost electric railway in the world, that twelve trains passed through it every day, travelling between Uppsala and Narvik, that the population of Abo was twelve thousand in 1862, and that Gustavus Adolphus ascended the throne of Sweden in 1611. He also gave some facts about Greta Garbo. My father told the American that a dead baby was required for the mass of sans secaire, that an elemental was a kind of mouth in space that sucked at you and tried to gulp you down, that homeopathic magic was practiced by the aborigines of Australia, and that a Lapland woman was careful at her confinement to have no knots or loops about her person, lest these should make the delivery difficult. The American, who had been looking at my father in a strange way for some time, took offence at this and walked away, so that there was nothing for it but to go to bed. My father walked upstairs on willpower alone. His faculties seemed to have shrunk and confused themselves. He had to help himself with the banister. He seemed to be navigating himself by wireless from a spot about a foot above his forehead. The issues that were involved had ceased to have any meaning. But he went on doggedly up the stairs, moved forward by pride and contrariety. It was physical fear that alienated him from his body, the same fear he had felt as a boy, walking down long corridors to be beaten. He walked firmly up the stairs. Oddly enough, he went to sleep at once. He had climbed all day and been awake all night and suffered emotional extremes. Like a condemned man who was to be hanged in the morning, my father gave the whole business up and went to sleep. He was woken at midnight exactly. He heard the American on the terrace below his window, explaining excitedly that there had been a cloud on the last two nights at 11.58, thus making it impossible to photograph the midnight sun. He heard the camera click. There seemed to be a sudden storm of hail and wind. It roared at his window sill, and the window curtains lifted themselves taut, pointing horizontally into the room. The shriek and rattle of the tempest framed the window in a crescendo of growing sound, an increasing blizzard directed toward himself. A blue paw came over the sill. My father turned over and hid his head in the pillow. He could feel the doomed head dawning at the window and the eyes fixing themselves upon the small of his back. He could feel the places, physically, about four inches apart. They itched, or else the rest of his body itched except those places. He could feel the creature growing into the room, glowing like ice and giving off a storm. His mosquito curtains rose in its afflatus, uncovering him, leaving him defenseless. He was in such an ecstasy of terror that he almost enjoyed it. He was like a bather plunging for the first time into freezing water and unable to articulate. He was trying to yell, but all he could do was to throw a series of hooting noises from his paralyzed lungs. He became a part of the blizzard. The bedclothes were gone. He felt the troll put out its hands. My father was an agnostic, but like most idle men he was not above having a bee in his bonnet. His favorite bee was the psychology of the Catholic Church. He was ready to talk for hours about psychoanalysis and the confession. His greatest discovery had been the rosary. The rosary, my father used to say, was intended solely as a factual occupation which calmed the lower senses of the mind. The automatic telling of the beads liberated the higher centers to mediate upon the mysteries. They were a sedative like knitting or counting sheep. There was no better cure for insomnia than a rosary. For several years he had given up deep breathing or regular counting. When he was sleepless he lay on his back and told his beads, and there was a small rosary in the pocket of his pajama coat. The troll put out its hands to take him around the waist. He became completely paralyzed, as if he had been winded. The troll put its hands upon the beads. They met the occult forces in a clash above my father's heart. There was an explosion, he said, a quick creation of power, positive and negative, a flash, a beam, something like the splutter with which the antenna of a tram meets its overhead wires again when it's being changed about. The troll made a high squealing noise, like a crab being boiled, 
and began rapidly to dwindle in size. It dropped my father and turned about and ran wailing, as if it had been terribly burned for one window. Its color waned as its size decreased. It was one of those air toys now that expire with a piercing whistle. It scrambled over the window sill, scarcely larger than a little child, and sagging visibly. My father leaped out of bed and followed it to the window. He saw it drop on the terrace like a toad, gather itself together, stumble off, staggering and whistling like a bat, down the valley of the Abiskayok. My father fainted. In the morning the manageress said, There has been such a terrible tragedy. The poor doctor professor was found this morning in the lake. The worry about his wife had certainly unhinged his mind. A subscription for the wreath was started by the American, to which my father subscribed five shillings, and the body was shipped off next morning. On one of the twelve trains that travel between Uppsala and Narvik every day. The End The Troll was written by T. H. White and read for you by Edward E. French. This recording is copyright 2024 by Edward E. French. Inquiries are invited at email edwardfrench06 at hotmail.com. And subscribe to our Fiction Fantastique channel, if you haven't already. That's www.youtube.com forward slash French Edward 06. Good night.